It's been a beautiful summer and a beautiful day, so thank you for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. So a very, very special thank you to Core Electric Cooperative um, and to Christy and Tiffany from REMAX Alliance for their community support of tonight's town hall meeting. And then for My Mountain Town, um, Sharon is back there taping. And so is Christy from Conifer Council. <laughs> and we've got Vanna White's back there. Um, and then also Conifer Jazzercise for, um, for providing the water. And then we do have um, some very special people that we want to recognize tonight. And one way that we're doing that is with cake. So we have cake and cookies, and you're welcome to, to get a piece of cake or a cookie um, at any point. So um, thank you guys for, for getting that already back there. So um, a link will be available tomorrow um, for the meeting. So um, if you want to watch it again, or you know anybody that would like to get the information that we have been giving given to you tonight, um, that link will be available so that the, this whole meeting will um, be taped and they can watch it tomorrow or any time that they would like to actually. So all of our speakers have been asked to present just the facts, um, not to support or in opposition, opposition to any development, person, candidate, um, ballot issue, anything like that. And there will be no campaigning. So our, we do have a few candidates here tonight, and they will be behind their tables. And during the next open house, you can go up and get their literature and ask them questions and, and everything. But if you could wait until then, and they will, they will be behind their tables, so they will be ready to talk to you. So thank you all the, the candidates for being here. We really appreciate that. So most of you have been here before, and you know the drill. But during our presentations, there are no comments, no questions, and so that the speakers get a lot of information to you, and then you can go up and talk to them after the meeting at 8 o'clock and um, actually ask them all the questions you want to, you know, whatever. So um, we appreciate you um, doing that for us. So what is going on around here so much? The Conifer Chamber has been really busy over the summer, and um, they still have so much going on. So we have Beth Schneider, Chamber Director, um, here to talk about that. Beth. Thank you, Shirley. Good evening, everyone, um, and thank you to the Conifer Area Council for including us in this meeting to keep you posted on what we're doing at the Chamber. And most of you know we had Elevation Celebration the last weekend of July. Um, we have an incredible group of volunteers who make that event happen. And so my message to you today is if you're interested in getting involved in some of the community events that the Chamber puts on, please see me and let me know. We'll get you connected in either planning or the day of the event. Um, our next big event is December 7th, and that's our Christmas parade and holiday market. So the, the market and all of the food trucks and all of the vendors usually are there around 10 or 11. We don't have the official time frame of everything yet. And then the parade is at 2 o'clock. Um, we haven't determined the theme, but we usually have about 40 um, incredible floats and so you have an opportunity if you'd like to sponsor a nonprofit float you have that opportunity as well as creating your own float um, so keep an eye out for the theme and what we have going with that and again you're you're all very welcome to help participate in any of these events um, our last you may have all received or you should have all received your community directory um, in the mail that went out to 10,000 houses along the 285 corridor and the other thing that we're looking for tonight that I think you might all have some great ideas for is some pertinent community content, um, like things about the fire department, um, anything like that that you think that people in our community should have on their coffee table or in their drawer where they store the directory. Please let me know if you have ideas or suggestions for content. We're always looking for that. And thank you again for being here, um, and thank you, Shirley, for having us. Thank you, Mary. 
Next we have Jessica Paulson. She's the Assistant Director of Public Services um, with the Libraries. And she's going to talk about the progress of our standalone Conifer Library and what's going on at the library. Jessica. Thanks, Shirley. Hi, everyone. It's great to be back. Um, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I wanted to give you an update on where we are with the Conifer Library and the move out of the high school. Um, over the summer, we did sign a 10-year lease um, at 27122 Main Street, so it's in that Safeway complex, um, and so that will be the home of the new Conifer Library. It will have dedicated parking spaces, easier physical access, um, and we're going to do everything we can to have uh, more hours and increased programming for all of you. Um, I wanted to thank you all for the input that you've given us over the last year and a half. We've had community meetings. We recently had a design charrette with um, a few community stakeholders. And we've really taken all of that feedback to heart. And so now is the time when we're sharing that with our architects. Um, they've been um, helping us with those community input sessions, and we are in the design phase of things. So we're hoping to do construction work to turn it into a library um, throughout the winter, and we look forward to keeping you updated um, along the way. If you do want to stay updated yourself, we do have a project website. It's jeffcolibrary.org slash conifer-opportunity. And that's going to have all the latest information. Um, or you can sign up for the emails that we send out monthly related to this, pro um, this project as well. Um, next month, we will have a new manager at the Conifer Library. So I look forward to introducing him to all of you at the next town hall um, in November. Um, but before I finish up, I just wanted to share some of the events that we have coming up. Um, we've got things for people of all ages. So there's an adult book swap coming up on October 1st, where you can bring a book and take a book. Um, teens can decorate caramel apples um, later this month because it's fall. And then um, we've got like a Jack Lantern event for all ages um, coming up in October as well. So hopefully we'll see you at the library soon for one of those events. And um, I'll be hanging out in the back if you want to talk to me afterwards. Thanks. Thanks, Jessica. Okay, well, the new Chief Executive Officer um, at CORE is with us tonight. Um, CORE Electric Cooperative, Pam Furenstein. Did I say that right? Okay, okay. Um, anyway, she's with us, and um, she's been up in Conifer all day because I saw her at noon, too. So she's, I think she's going to love it. She loves Conifer. Um, but anyway, welcome, Pam. Thank you, Shirley. All right. Well, hi everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, like Shirley said, I'm Pam Feirstein. I'm the new uh, Chief Executive Officer for CORE um, as of the end of July. Uh, so relatively new, but I'm not new to CORE. I've been at CORE for almost 15 years in various roles, but my primary role was the Chief Operating Officer for about 10 years of the 15 I've been there. Um, so that was engineering, operations, power supply, safety. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the things that we do at CORE. And prior to that, I was at an engineering consulting firm for 15 years where I did engineering, planning, detailed design, management for projects for CORE. Uh, so I can really say that I've been with CORE for about 30 years. Um, I'm from Montana and I went to Montana State and I'm an electrical engineer by trade. So that's just kind of a little bit about me. I do have a few things I'd like to talk to you about, about what CORE is up to. Um, First, I want to just hit on our strategy. And our strategy, we've been put together um, and refining for several years, and it's been led by our board of directors. Ron Kilgore is the representative for the Confer area, and you know our board does an amazing job setting the strategy and the vision for the organization. But what I really want to point out on this is that you know are these three pillars: organizational excellence, operational optimization, and business transformation. <laughs> Their main purpose is to build up to provide the best service to our members, our partners, and our communities. 
One of the biggest things that CORE has going on is our energy transition. Several years ago, we made the decision to move away from our all requirements contract with Excel Energy, and that's where we buy our power from. And the reason we did that was we felt with all of the changes that are happening in the industry and uh, the requirements that the state are putting on that we could take more control in, uh, of our destiny, right? Um, and not have control on what resources that we put on our system to serve you and not be subject to all of the cost increases that Excel is going to have in their rates. So we made that decision to move away. 1-1-2026 is that Freedom Day. Um, and we've been working very hard on acquiring resources under power purchase agreements in order to meet our demand loads, but also meet the state requirements, which are we have to have an 80% reduction of our carbon footprint by uh, 2030. So you kind of see on this load mix, we're going to go, and this is just for talking purposes, it's not the exact where we'll end up, but we're going to move from, away from coal. Um, based on state requirements, and we're going to have more wind, solar, batteries, and then some gas plants that are going to help back up the wind and solar when the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining. We can continue to grow, which is great. We've set about 70 new services up in Conifer in district in about the last 12 months. So Conifer's growing. The rest of our 5,000 square mile service territory continues to grow. And we look to bring in economic development projects, large commercial projects that can help balance our residential load with uh, some different load shapes of com large commercial that runs 24-7 um, to, again, help put some downward pressure on, on, our, on our upward rate pressures that we're all facing. So I know for Conifer wildfire at risk and wildfire mitigation is extremely important and it's very important to CORE. We have a very um, aggressive wildfire mitigation plan and it's made up of a whole bunch of things. But the, the main things are things you probably see up here all the time is our lining out doing operation uh, patrols. You may see drones out flying the lines looking for problems so that we can fix them before there's an issue. Our vegetation crews up here doing a lot of vegetation management. And then we have other programs, um, situational awareness. We've added a lot of uh, technology to our system so that we have cameras uh, that are AI and on satellite that can detect plume smokes and notify first responders very quickly so that they can get there and hopefully prevent any sort of wildfire from spreading. So we're doing a lot in this area and we continue to look at new technologies and invest in ways to um, mitigate any of our equipment causing fires. Another thing we do is alternate relay settings, which you guys experienced in April. Um, there was a large wind event. We did have a lot of outages, but they were not outages. Uh, they were problems where trees were getting in the lines and things like that. Um, but we had sensitive relay settings to trip quickly. So again, that we would not instigate a fire, and uh, we did not have a fire during those, that event, we did have outages, uh, and we did not proactively shut off the power for that event. Um, that is an option in our plan, that if we think the weather conditions are such that um, things could be so bad that we would proactively shut off the power before an outage occurred, we could do that, but we have not done that to date. So with all of our growth, um, the conifer, current conifer office, we've kind of outgrown that. It was built in the 70s um, with all of the maintenance and work that we do. And up here in conifer, we made the determination to buy a new piece of property and buy a new building. And we're really excited about this. It's uh, in the town of Pine area, and we hope to move in at the end of December. And it's really going to help retain and attract employees and provide them a great workspace, a lot of more, a lot more storage space for our vehicles, our equipment, our materials, and uh, we're really excited for that. The other thing that's great is we're cooperative, which means you guys are member owners on equity in court. So not like an investor owned where uh, all the profits get returned to shareholders, uh, our margins that we make, the board makes a determination on what goes back to the member and then what 
we need to keep to remain to do our maintenance and our system uh, improvement projects. This year, they voted in September, to, or in August, to return $12.25 million uh, to the members. Um, that could be current members or former members of CORE, and you will see start seeing that credit on your September bills. And then finally, our members and our communities are very important to us, and we do a lot of giving in our various communities, whether it's for schools, help with fire, wildfire mitigation, uh, 4-H, uh, parks, uh, parks and rec. We try to give back to our communities. A new program that we started is called, called Core Gives. And this is a partnership with uh, Colorado, with Colorado Gives. And it just is another way that if you're looking for a way to donate uh, to a, a good organization, you can go through our Core Gives website and uh, donate to one of these local nonprofits that help people in need um, within your community. And you know it's going to your community. So with that, um, I think that's the end. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. And again, welcome to Conifer. We're glad to have her. Okay, so next we have Commissioner Leslie Dalcamper, and she's going to be she's here for a Jeffco update. There's always so much going on at Jeffco, so I don't ever give her enough time. I know. <laughs> Thanks so much, Shirley. Hi, everyone. How are you tonight? It's so good to be back with you. Nice to see you all. I do have a lot of updates for you, but first, I want to thank the uh, Conover Area Council for hosting tonight's election forum with an opportunity to meet the candidates who are running for office. I want to thank all the candidates who are stepping forward. On the Board of County Commissioners, we have two seats that are open this November, District 1 and District 2. I also wanted to mention that Commissioner Andy Kerr very much wanted to be here tonight. However, he is our liaison to Dr. Cobb, which is a metro area organization focusing on issues like transportation, housing, and more. We'll see if we can't get them up here um, next month because I'm looking forward to serving on the affordable housing panel that is being hosted um, as well. I think that uh, is just across the way in every, if I'm not mistaken. But a couple of quick things I'd like to share with you. As you know, our Together, Init Together Jeffco initiative has been focused on a myriad of issues, everything from how the Board of County Commissioners makes decisions about land use and rezoning, how that affects your quality of life right here at Conifer and other communities. A big part of this effort has focused on wildfire risk reduction. That's been a huge component, including updating the county's wildfire preparedness plan along with the evacuation annex, which is a supplement uh, to the Together Jeffco initiative. And I just want to take a moment to give a huge shout out to our amazing team at the Jeffco Sheriff's Office. They're all sitting right there pretending that I'm not talking about them right now. Of course, our sheriff. And we can't do this work without our fire chiefs and their teams as well. And we deeply appreciate your expertise. And, your and most important to this conversation is each of you. We now have drafts of the CWPP and the evacuation annex online at togetherjeffco.com. Please take a look because we've incorporated the feedback you've shared with us at town halls and we're so grateful and we need you to uh, weigh in. Let us know if we missed anything. Does it communicate clearly? And are there any other priorities that you have that we should be aware of? I also want to mention, we just heard today at a, a meeting with the county manager and with Jeffco Open Space that those pine beetles are back. Have you seen them on some of your some of your trees? I'm seeing a number of heads nodding. We heard from Jeffco Open Space that we're seeing an uptick in pine beetles across the foothills communities in Jefferson County, especially here in Conifer in the Foxton and Elk Creek areas, uh, just south of 285. And if you are looking for tips, uh, need more information about invasive species, I encourage you to take a look at the Jeffco Open Space website. In addition, two other quick, how am I doing, Angela, on time? Yeah. Oh, all right then, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> and just share with you that 
It is that time of the season, and for us, it means it's time to take a look at the Jefferson County budget. We're looking very closely at what you have told us are your priorities in terms of how we provide essential county services, ranging from public safety, crime prevention, looking at wildfire risk mitigation, and so much more. We are looking at uh, potentially $20 million in budget cuts, and you may be wondering, well, wait a minute, my uh, home value increased with it the property taxes I'm paying in the general revenue fund is largely funded by your property taxes but we have a, a state mandated revenue cap so dollars that we collect above that cap are returned to you in the form of a refund check this year we will be returning about 30.5 million dollars in a refund check but we're also looking at 20 million dollars in budget cuts to tackle this issue, and I'm going to keep it factual surely, I promise, county commissioners voted unanimously to place a ballot question on the November ballot to ask voters to remove the revenue cap just as 62 other counties across the county, Colorado, across the state, Colorado, have done. Finally, ballots mail out around on October 10th, and then last but not least, September also marks uh, the uh, effort for snow removal preparedness. We know forecasters are predicting a very wet winter ahead, and I know our Jetco Open Space teams who plow the trailheads, as well as our incredible Aurora Bridge team, you're going to hear from Mike Veneta, who has a transportation in just a moment, are already working on getting well prepared uh, to ensure we keep our communities safe. Thanks so much, everyone, for the time. I really appreciate it, and you can always reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And now we have Mike Vanetta. He is the Director of Transportation and Engineering. Did I get that right? Okay. Um, and he's here to give just a little bit of an update on roads and trails at Jeffco, and especially Conifer. Many roads. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. So I've been with uh, the county for 28 years, so I've had my hands on most every project that's been around the county, for sure. You know, from improving the, the school drainage to Sutton Road or whatever, uh, different projects in this area. So we try to keep things moving along and having staff come up and take over. And so I'm quite familiar with the Conifer area, and I'm impressed you guys actually have grown quite a bit since uh, last time I've been up here. So uh, we have uh, Part of the together, Jeffco, we have a transportation mobility plan, and uh, we're trying to, that's the uh, safety, identify all the safety improvements needed for Jefferson County. That plan I plan on presenting, uh, actually I have a Christina Lane, a uh, planner of ours, will be presenting on November 14th at the Conifer Chamber. So she'll have a presentation that will describe uh, um, about 30 some sites in this area of uh, safety improvements have been identified. And um, so what we should do is go through those areas to identify uh, that they found uh, safety improvements. And we'll try to say, if we get funding or have more funding, we'll try to lobby to get those areas improved around your community. Uh, and other than that, we're going to have uh, improvements this year coming up in one not area. Some of the ones, I didn't read my Bible, but sorry. <laughs> this is when you get old. Um, so, so South Foxton Road, uh, the county's going to be overlaying South Foxton Road uh, from 285 to Reynolds Park, about eight miles. That should be happening within a month. Uh, Pleasant, Pleasant Park Road, east of 285, the county will be overlaying Pleasant Park Road uh, to Kestra Road. That's about 6.5 miles in the area. Uh, Markley Road, east of JC73, uh, the summer of 2025 will be resurfaced in that area. And along with all these projects that we do list here, we have to have a staff that goes through and evaluate all the culverts, the critical uh, structures that need to be replaced before they do the overlay, obviously, so that you don't um, tear the road back up. So we have engineering go along behind, ahead of this system, trying to get ahead of them all to get the roads ready for uh, paving. Um, there's an overlay west of 285. It's a uh, Conifer Mountain Drive. Um, Shadow Mountain Drive, west of J73 in 2026. That's been scheduled for an overlay of the area. And then uh, J73 intersection of Barkley, Crawford High School, and Shadow Mountain Drive. We're actually looking at some studies in there about the roundabouts in those areas. So uh, right now we have no funding for it. 
but um, the signals can fail sometimes. It's not operationally great, and the roundabouts can help control the speed in that area, kind of like you do at um, North Turkey Creek uh, Drive. And when in all of these uh, projects, we try to widen as much as possible to get better shoulders, so we don't have drop off wheel um, or people's tires go off and bounce the other way and head on like that. So. Uh, that's all that has to be engineered to figure out what we can do for roundabouts. Um, we're also in support of uh, CDOT uh, for the 285 and Kings Valley interchange. That's a uh, $60 million project to try to get funded. And then um, they're about a third of the way in terms of design, and that'll be a big interchange on 285. We should help out that area. Um, and there's some intersection improvements along uh, US 25 and Pine Valley, and they'll be doing some normal trips. And speaking of CDOT, at that November 14 meeting, they're going to have somebody from CDOT there also. So if you want to try to get both sides of the transportation system in here, they'll have a PowerPoint, a little more information for you than I have right now. But I just want to let you guys know what's going on in the area that you should be seeing pretty soon uh, in your neighborhood, hopefully. Thank you very much. Wow, that's a lot of stuff going on, right? Um, you know, I've been late to a few meetings lately, but it, I've been just fine with that because we've got new paved roads. It's amazing. It's great. So thank you, Mike. We've been working with Mike for several years, our trails team. Um, a lot of the trails that we've gotten done in the Conifer area have um, been, well, Mike's worked on them. So thank you, Mike, for that. <laughs> okay, next, and I saw him come in the door, um, we have um, Senator Mark Baisley, um, uh, just for a, a very short legislative update, and here he is. Here you go. Well, thanks, Shirley. Thank you for accommodating me. Good to see you, everyone. I'm Mark Baisley, and I'm uh, honored to serve with your state senator. So, uh, let's see. We had a special session, as you know, uh, a couple weeks ago. And the, uh, the topic to be addressed was uh, property taxes. And with the property valuation shooting way up, of course, what followed was higher taxes. Um, I'm happy to report that a compromise was uh, held between everybody, all parties, which is how the founders intended it in the first place. And people did come together. I want to give credit to the, to the folks, especially those of you who signed the petitions to get a couple of ballot measures, 108 and 60, on the ballot which brought everybody to the table to negotiate because um, while we would have had the advantage of a cap of 4% on property taxes increasing with one of those ballot measures, there were some flaws in there that were going to cause some other unintended consequences. And so all of that got worked out pretty nicely uh, between all, all the, uh, the worldviews uh, in the legislature. So uh, it's not great, but it is a lot better than what uh, you would have been suffering. So, um, as I mentioned last time I was here, I think that we have not resolved, we still have not resolved the, the underlying issue, which is I believe that we need to dissociate values, property values, as a calculation for property taxation. So I, I did introduce a bill in the special session to do that. Of course, it got, it got killed, but uh, there also that exercise, which uh, was really the first step for me. So I'll, I'll keep working on that one. Um, let me, since I've just got just a moment, let me just talk to what's been on uh, the minds of a lot of constituents for me in the eight counties that I represent, and that is uh, the uh, gang situation that, that keeps growing. So I'm going to assume that that's on your head and heart, your concern as well. Um, I ran a bill earlier this year that would have overridden some of the restrictions that keep law enforcement from being able to work directly with ICE, with federal government, when they, they ca catch someone that they know is a gang member and not supposed to be in the country in the first place, right now they're not able to, uh, they have a lot of restrictions on their ability to interact with ICE. So that bill of mine failed. However, uh, sheriffs across the state have been asking me to run that again now that this uh, situation has become more real. So I intend to do that in January when we go back into session. So those are the two biggest things on my head. And uh, I don't want to take up any more time I'm supposed to, but uh, thanks everyone for turning out. I will stick around for the evening so we can talk on the side if, you know, if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. 
Okay, and now we have Heather Gutherless. Um, she's the planning supervisor, model range planning, and she's going to talk about all the development going on in Conifer. Thanks, Shirley. So there is a lot that has been happening since last April when I was here to talk about development cases. So I do have a lot of slides. I'm going to go through some of them quickly because there are a lot of things going on. There are still 29 cases, which is the same number as there were back in April. However, they've changed. So we have six new pre-applications, five rezoning or special use updates. We have we actually have one new community meeting. I, I found it out today from, uh, from one of our other planners, but I didn't get a chance to update this slide. So it's added in there, bonus for you. And two new subdivision plan updates and a site development plan update. I'll go through what all of those cases are also before each one. So as far as pre-applications, as a refresher, a pre-application is a very preliminary process that somebody can do whether they own the property or not. They do need to have consent of the owner. But they can come in and say, hey, you know, I have this idea. What would it take to go through the county process? What would the county think? What are the things that I need to be aware of? And so they come to us and we talk to them and refer it out to a few select agencies. Um, and there's no public notice on this because if they do come in for a formal application, there are other opportunities for that. But they're very preliminary. So the first one that I have is down in the Pine Grove area. And it is a rezoning, a pre-application for a rezoning from commercial to residential. There's a residential use, but it has old commercial zoning, so they wanted to update it. The second one is off of South Deer Creek Road. This may look familiar because last, actually it was just in June, a special use was approved on this site in, for a religious facility, uh, a religious re retreat, I should say. So it won't be regular church services or anything like that, but it's a, a retreat facility. Now they're coming in, their special use was approved, so they're coming in to do that lot layout and figure out where everything is going transportation, drainage, all the technical items. The next one is near the intersection of South Elk Creek Road and 285. And this is an area where somebody wants to take about 40 acres and subdivide the property into four lots. This is already zoned agricultural with a 10 acre minimum lot size. So this is something that the, the area plan would not apply but um, it would have to conform with zoning. For the next pre-application, it is kind of in that Green Valley area, right near the park and ride. And I always have a hard time with the pointer. I think I just turned it off. I'm sorry. So the, I'll just talk about it while I'm here. So this is a, it's a, an existing vet clinic and they wanted to expand some of their uses to not allow for any kennels but to allow for an accessory structure for animal holding post-op and for adoption events and that would require a rezoning. So next I'm going to go to the rezonings and special use cases because I know a lot of people are interested in a specific special use case that's been going on. There is four rezoning special use. The process is similar for both. And there are multiple opportunities for public comment during that process. First one is before anybody even applies, they need to come in and do a community meeting. After that, the formal referral is sent out to all HOAs that are registered with the county and property owners within a certain radius. And there's another opportunity for comments. And then at the Planning Commission and Board of County Commissioners hearings, there, are, there is time for public testimony in these processes. Those are both processes where somebody wants to change the land use that currently exists on the property. So maybe they want to go from agricultural to more residential use or agricultural to commercial. They would need to go through the rezoning process. So the first rezoning that just recently came in, this is a new one. Oh, this is, sorry, this is a community meeting, so they haven't applied yet. This is your bonus. The community meeting recently occurred August 27th, and this is right near the Conifer High School on, uh, in between 73 and 285, and they wanted to rezone to allow for mixed-use residential, light industrial, office, or self-storage 
on nine acres. So if they move forward, their next step would be the formal application. Next, uh, there is a rezoning to kind of downzone property from MR2, which was for duplexes, to MR1. And that is off of Crestview in the Hilldale Pines area. The big one that I know a lot of people are interested in is the bike park. They had last week there were two planning commission hearings. They heard, they got through all public testimony on September 11th and September 12th. They did not get to deliberation or being able to ask staff or the applicant questions. And so they are continuing that case again till September 23rd. And this is the lift assisted bike park that's proposed off of Shadow Mountain. Uh, because of that continuance, the Board of County Commissioners is currently scheduled for October 1st. There is a, a good chance that that will get postponed to make sure that there is adequate timing between the Planning Commission and Board of County Commissioners. If it is, that would be announced at that October 1st hearing. So they would still hold it and then continue it to a date certain. The, I think this is the last rezoning case, maybe. And this is also another one down in the Pine Grove area. Currently there's a little shop that sells refreshments, food and drink, and they want to allow people to stay there. There were some restrictions before on their water use that um, planning staff at the time wanted to restrict it so that people couldn't stay there, uh, out, stay there and eat, not stay there overnight. And so they need to rezone in order to be able to have people um, have it more like a restaurant type use. So next I'm going to talk about a couple of subdivision plats really quickly. The difference between a rezoning and a subdivision plat is that the zoning, the allowed uses, are already in place. Which means for the subdivision plat, we're really looking at a lot more technical issues. Where the lot line's going to go, where the road's going to go, what, how will drainage be accomplished? Because we want to make sure that all those technical issues are addressed. There are two subdivision updates, and one of them is a case that was recently approved in July. That was a two-lot subdivision on 30 acres off of El Pico Drive. And then the second one, is they changed. They went from the first referral to the second referral since April. And that is just near north, it's just south of North Turkey Creek, near Starlight Drive, and that is also a three-lot subdivision. And then last, there was an update on a site development plan. Site development plans are very similar to, um, to plans in that the zoning is already in place. However, uh, its site development plan is approved administratively, so it doesn't go to the Board of County Commissioners like a plan does. A plan has a public hearing before the Planning Commission and the Board of County Commissioners. So this case is off of South Turkey Creek Road. And it is a site development plan to expand boarding services related to an existing behavioral health care facility. And this one is a case where it's already zoned, but they want to expand some of their uses within that allowed zoning. They came in and made their formal application, so they're in their first referral stage. Those are all the development cases. And so now I'm just going to briefly talk about Together Jeffco, which two other people have already talked about, so that's awesome. Great to get the word out about Together Jeffco. This slide shows all the different plans that are involved in the Together Jeffco process. The big item right now that Commissioner Dahlkemper mentioned is that we do have the Community Wildfire Protection Plan and Evacuation Annex out for review, out for public review. It's on the TogetherJeffCo.com website, and comments are due Sunday, September 22nd. Originally, we were thinking Friday, but then we were like, you know what, the consultant's not going to get to the comments before the weekend, so we want to make sure that everybody has the ample opportunity to view those documents and comment. There is a feedback form on the website so that you can fill it out right then and there. And then I'll just really quickly, short-term rentals, I know it's been going slowly, and we have had a little bit of progress in that we've received an address identification. We're held, looking to finalize a contract. And we are doing some internal review of a draft. So hopefully that will be out to the public. OK. 
coming up sometime soon. <laughs> okay, I think that's all. Sorry, it's a little bit. Thanks, Heather. She always has so much, so much information to give in so little time. So, um, okay. Um, at the beginning of the meeting, all of our candidates were not here yet. So I just want to introduce who is here, and for, for you just to wave or something, um, and then everybody can go and talk to the candidates um, at, the, at about eight o'clock. So we either have a candidate or a representative um, for candidates. Um, we have um, here someone for um, Rachel Zenninger, actually Jeffco Commissioner, um, District 1. We've got Rachel Zenzinger and Charlie Johnson. So they are both here, or at least a representative of them. For District 2 County Commissioner, we have Andy Kerr and Natalie Menton. So we can go talk to, to them. And then for District 7, the U.S. House, um, uh, Sergi, I'm going to massacre this one, um, Matviak. Okay, did I get that right? Thank you. Okay, wow. Um, so he's here to talk to. And then for um, House District 25, we have George Mama um, right back here. And we've got Tammy Story over here. So please go and talk to them um, at 8 o'clock and um, get as much information as you like. So. We have had, in the last um, couple of weeks, um, some unfortunate situations and, um, you know, in our small little rural community. And Sheriff Reggie Mark Marinelli is going to talk just a little bit about that. Um, I don't know exactly what she's going to say, but she's going to tell you whatever she can. Gotcha. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. It's always a pleasure to come back. And, and be able to talk to the Comfort community. Real quick, don't start my time yet. Real quick, I do want to mention and thank uh, my team from emergency management that worked the Cory Fire, the Gulch Fire, and about five other ones. So with us tonight, under Sheriff Scott Eddy is over there. Um, Mark Gutke, who is our Wildfire Program Manager. Um, Nate Wayington, who is our Emergency Manager. And then Brian Keating, our fire management officer. And special thanks to the partnerships we have with our fire department. It is amazing to work with them uh, to prepare and uh, then deal with the situations we have to deal with. Okay. So tonight I was asked um, to come and talk about the recent situations um, with the uh, gunshot wound that one of our um, Dakota Ridge High School students received. And I purposely did not read the reports um, because this is a situation that both sides needs to be talked about and for the safety of our community moving forward. First of all, um, I'm also aware that there was a letter sent out by the principal from this uh, middle school to all the parents in reference to some of the behaviors of the students here while walking from here to nearby businesses. And so know that our school resource officer um, is with the principal, with our own schools, with the commanders that work up here, um, with the sheriff's department and my division chief of patrol so that we can try to educate the kids to not go on to people's property. Um, I know the situation that has hit the media um, last week. Uh, there were some young men that jumped a fence trying to look for a place to take photographs. They were on private property. So we have to be able to teach our younger generation that if there's a fence, especially um, signage that says no trespassing, we should adhere to that. If you are walking down the street to get somewhere, you should not cut through other people's property. There are issues with that. Um, people are very protective of their property as they should be. 
So on the other side of that, there was a gun involved. And so I would just caution people. Um, everybody has the right to protect their properties. We at the Sheriff's Department, we deal with facts. We pull the facts out in every case, and that is what we deal with. We deal with the laws that are on the books. And so um, I, would, I would highly suggest that gun ownership, um, which is everybody's right, obviously, I'm a cop, I own guns. Um, I would never tell somebody to, to um, do anything with their weapons or with their right to protect their property. However, if you do pull a gun out, know what it's being pointed at and um, do what you can to get that education um, to be a proper gun owner so that we don't have a tragic event happen accidentally. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, it's a two-sided story. There's two sides to it. Both sides have some education value to it. And um, I'm going to leave it at that uh, for right now. I will stay afterwards if anybody has any questions, um, concerns, comments. Um, you're more than welcome to always approach me. I talked to somebody earlier who had made made the statement that they wanted to call me to make an appointment. I'm okay with that. Call and make an appointment and come see me, or we can talk on the telephone. I don't. The microphone has issues, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll try another one here. And so lastly, since I can can still have a couple seconds, and I know it's time, we are opening up um, National Coffee with a Cop. We're doing it a little bit differently. We are not going to the communities. We are going to have all of the communities come to us. So the second, October 2nd, which is the first Wednesday in October, that's National Coffee with a Cop Day. We invite everybody in this room to come see us at our headquarters. Um, we are going to open everything up. You will be able to talk to our people that are in emergency management. You will be able to talk to my finance director. Um, we are going to be completely transparent on everything we do. So that's October 2nd. We're doing it twice. Once in the morning. Don't quote me on this. I think it's 7 a.m. Again in the evening at 5 o'clock. Coffee with a cop. Bring your kids. We have partnered with Jeffco Public Library, and we are going to have milk and cookies for the kids who can sit with our deputies and read books, and the public library will be supplying books for the kids to take home. So come join us. We'd love to see you. Get on our social media sites, X and Facebook, and it has it all on there so you can get the proper times and all of that, and come see us for Coffee with a Cop. Thank you. Thank you, Reggie. Um, so tonight, we have some very, very, very special, awesome people that we want to recognize and thank so very, very much. Um, Reggie's already talked about some of the um, emergency personnel here um, from the Sheriff's Office. Um, we also have firefighters here. Um, <coughs> fire chiefs here are going to speak in just a moment. You know, they keep us safe all of the time. So they do an amazing job with that. But they also kept us from having a horrific outcome during the quarry fire. Amazing. I can't even believe that no houses and no people. No lives lost, no houses lost. So we have to thank them so very, very much. And I would like to see everybody stand up and tell these guys thank you. You guys are awesome. And now we have the three fire chiefs that are going to be talking a little bit about the glory fire, some other things, and also maybe some things to come in the future. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, appreciate being here tonight. So I think we're last, so I can put that thing down. We're going to have all the time we want, right? <laughs> Just kidding. We're just waiting. So thank you for having us tonight. My name is Skip Sherlock. I'm joined by my partners, uh, Chief Jacob Ware and Chief Kurt Rogers. 
We're going to talk to you guys about a few things tonight. One, some of the things we're working on immediately, and then we're going to talk about the quarry fire as well. So, um, who here has possibly heard the term unification? All right, a lot of people. Great. So, um, as you know, um, we want to talk about the why, why we're working towards unification. As you know, our departments are made up largely of incredible volunteer firefighters. And as we've talked to you before, volunteerism is down to struggle. We struggle immensely to find volunteers and we struggle to keep volunteers. It's a hard job, it's very demanding, it requires quite a bit from our people, it's hard to keep. We follow a national trend. This is not new throughout the country. Fire departments are closing nationally, or they're combining. If we look down the hill, West Metro or Nevada, they were all volunteer fire departments, but could not keep up with the demands of the community and needed to go to a more of a paid department. That is what we are working towards with unification. We're trying to address the issue of, uh, of volunteerism that's, that's basically, it's unfortunately uh, dying. We are all volunteers. We come from this. It's near and dear to our heart. But the reality is we can't keep up and meet the demands of the community. So we are continuing, we continue to work together. We're going to continue to do that. And our process of doing that is called unification. The short of it is Elk Creek's board and Inner Canyon's board will vote to basically be no more. They'll call that exclusion. And we will do what's called inclusion into North Fork's district. The reason we can do this is we drop to a mill. North Fork's mill will be 12 next year, which will be the lowest mill out of the three. So we're allowed to do that. Another question is how can we do that by going to a lower mill? It's because of the increased values of homes that we all saw last year allows us to do this. We're able to increase personnel, so add more paid personnel and work on infrastructure as well. So the reason we're doing this is we're trying to do it before tragedy strikes. We're, we're very lucky right now. We're lucky in that nothing bad has happened yet, but we feel like we're just one call away from not being able to respond. That can be that three-year-old who's not breathing that we can't get to because we don't have the personnel. It could just be someone who's in a great deal of pain that we can't get there and ease that pain. It could be structure fires. We work really well together, and we truly believe that this is the answer for us to continue to meet the demands of the community. So we're going to be around there to ask us more questions. We're trying to put a lot of stuff out media-wise, um, so keep paying attention to that, please. But as I said, we work really, really well together. We want to talk a little bit about that in the quarry fire, so I'm going to turn this over to... Um, I'm Chief Rogers with uh, the Marines Warrior Fire, and I uh, just want to thank you all for being here tonight. Um, just give a really good job of explaining what we're working towards here. We're going to talk about the Quarry Fire here um, in a little bit. Chief Rogers is going to go over what operationally happened with that fire. But I want to point out that we do this almost on a daily basis. Um, we have structure fires, we have medical emergencies, and we are all reliant on each other up here. Um, I don't know if you guys remember back earlier this summer, we had a structure fire start in Kings Valley that spread to the wildland. Um, and through some of our planning and what we've been able to do prior to this, we were able to put additional apparatus and personnel on the road quicker to help handle those situations. So this occurs frequently. There's a lot of things you don't hear about on a daily basis where we are helping each other. Um, I've been in the fire service for a long time, 40 years. Our reliance on each other, mutual aid-wise, has expanded tremendously during that time. And it gets to a point that we have to look for other solutions to how we're going to operate into the future. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Chief Ware in just a minute to talk about the quarry fire. But I again wanted to thank our partners at the Sheriff's Department um, and Emergency Management during the quarry fire. That was the smoothest transition I have seen in my 40 years of doing this. They did an outstanding job um, filling in and working with us as we attempted to get a handle on that fire early on. Uh, I don't have a timer into what's on. Back to the quarry fire. Uh, this was the final map. 
It was just under 600 acres. It took about seven days to uh, reach 100% containment. We had resources from all over the country here. Um, and it was, uh, it was a challenge. It kind of hit home. It was the first time in a long time we've actually had a wildfire that's going to threaten our area. So, Corey Fire started at uh, 9 o'clock, I think it was 9.05 when a Jeff Code deputy stumbled across it while he was on patrol. Came across it. <clears throat> we were actually out, Elk Creek was out on another call. We were next to a, one of the deputies who was looking at his cat notes, and the deputy said it was rapidly spreading over his cat notes. I said, well, interesting. All right, you know, odd. We, our senses were already up because if you guys remember, we also had another fire from the same cause two days prior by Twin Forks, the Twin Forks fire, which bumped 285, spotted across 285, and luckily got hung up by an on ramp. Um, that was another fire that would have been a bit of a problem. So it started that night. This is what we were dealing with that night. Um, obviously, we attempted some suppression efforts, pulled everybody off about 2 in the morning. It uh, basically was rocking and rolling. And we were guessing being 50 acres, 60 acres by 2 in the, uh, by two in the morning. 1.51 in the morning, 2 in the morning, this is from Inner Canyon Station 4. This was well, so the, uh, over on this side is where that our other picture was. It was down here. This is what it was doing by 2. It pretty much did this all throughout the night up until it laid down right around 6 in the morning. Next morning we got up. Picture on the left is from an aerial recon flight. That's about 8.30 in the morning. It kind of laid down. That usually happens cooler in the morning, higher RHs, etc. By the middle of the afternoon, that's what it was doing again. We started ordering a lot of resources. Checking my time. Um, we had, uh, nationally, we had a number of high, you know, high and high fires going across the West. We were prepared to sell the five, which means resources are busy all across the country. We put in an order for five hot chunk crews. We got two. Um, at this time, when we were doing a lot of the uh, recon and trying to figure out what was happening, our wildland captains were working back at the command post with our partners at the county starting to do some modeling, and that's when it really hit home. The modeling was showing it was going to impact Olden Park, Aspen Park area in less than two days. That's where everything kind of escalated. So going through a risk-benefit analysis and complexity analysis, this fire very quickly became one of the highest priority fires in the region and actually was ranked nationally on the priority list. Which, what that does, that frees up a lot of resources. We started ordering a lot. We weren't getting a lot, but we were able to get a lot of aviation. Uh, this is day two. Made another push up there. Still burning very actively in the afternoon. What we did get was, again, a lot of aviation. We had, uh, let's see if this is going to work. <sighs> but anyway. <laughs> At one point in time, we, uh, if, if anybody follows the fire tracker, the app on your phone, it almost looked comical. You couldn't even see the fire for the amount of aviation. We were getting aviation from Southern California. We had aviation from all over the country. It was, uh, it was a tremendous air show. With this air show, there were uh, a number of firsts. One of them, we've never been able, we've never had scoopers, which is the airplane on the uh, right over there. Those are the ones that Chatfield actually was closed down for two days so they could scoop out of Chatfield. Never done that before on the front range. Uh, we had three of them for a couple hours at one point in time. Uh, we also had large air tankers, very large air tankers, a number of Type 1, Type 2, and Type 3 helicopters all doing bucket work. Uh, and that's what... Uh, that's what helped start getting a handle on it. Because you can have all the aviation in the world, but if you don't have boots on the ground, actually following up all that retardant in water has a shelf life, it dries out. So you still have to have people boots on the ground to get up there and actually put in hand line after all this aircraft. Still won't take out. Bummer. All right. Oh no. Now I can't make it go. <laughs> that ends your time. <laughs> oh no. Anyway, so. A couple of the firsts we have on this fire. Through our partnerships with uh, Road Bridge as well as CDOT, we were able to get two bulldozers, which were integral in the suppression efforts. As far as as long as I've been around here, we've never been able to use bulldozers on the front range for fire suppression and drop blades. Uh, we put in a dozer line that I truly believe that dozer line was why the Samson community is still standing. Uh, that dozer line was put in, and then Sam on Hot Shots ended up burning off that line, which secured that line. The fire edge was probably three or 400 feet from private land. 
Uh, very close. Uh, oh well, it's hung up. This far again, very challenging. And if it wasn't for all of the uh, partnerships and all the work we put together on the back end, this was a proof of concept, working together. Our planning units, our community ambassadors that work within our planning units, our planning units were the foundation for a lot of the evacuations we pull off. We were working with the county on that and we were able to export those shape files, which made the evacuation a lot more successful than what we've had in the past. Again, to echo what Chief Rogers said, it's probably one of the smoothest experiences I've had on the transition and most of the operations, which again is due to the partnerships that we've developed working together. Oh, I was playing too. Anyway, <laughs> technology is not my strong suit. So what we ended up doing, we ended up firing out, doing a lot of uh, offensive and defensive firing to bring all this fire, to bring the fire down to the road to secure everything. And, oh, Oh, anyway, <laughs> so we had a lot of challenges on this fire, but again, it was successful because of working together in the partnerships, and I can't thank the sheriff and emergency management enough to make this a successful fire. Um, I've got a lot more we could talk about it for probably two hours, but that's kind of the 30,000 foot view of the, the quarry fire. Uh, very successful. It was all on county land. It did not touch any private land, which was pretty impressive that it stayed within the footprint of the uh, park. Um, I think the only resource damage on private land was some desert wine out of all of that. That's what we have. Thank you. Thank you for tonight and for always. You were amazing. So um, that is our last presentation. We have, as you know, a lot of people around that can um, can talk to you um, afterwards. You can ask all kinds of questions. Um, let them know your thoughts. Um, so please stick around, and especially stick around for cake. We are celebrating our firefighters and sheriff's department tonight. Um, so please get a piece of cake um, in their honor. There's there's cookies and everything too. Um, a couple things. We, um, Conifer Area Council, we're working on an update of our website. So we will be getting that information out to you soon. It'll probably be done within the next month, I would say. Um, so we'll have that. If you are not already on our email list, there is a list going back in the back, so please get on there. We send um, emails out about important community things going on, um, and of course the town hall meetings. And speaking of that, the next town hall meeting is November 20th. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Um, and again, I want to thank Core Electric Cooperative and Tiffany and Christy with Remax for their community support of tonight's meeting. So thank you all so much for coming, and we'll see you in November. And please have a piece of cake. Thank you.